Hello and welcome back to the ECG course. This is chapter 14. It's going to be a very easy and quick chapter on asystole and artifact. Now a couple quick points. Asystole uh, is literally the absence of systole, meaning that there is no electrical or mechanical activity coming from the heart. So let's just draw a big line through it because there's no conduction, no depolarization happening. And as a result, you get what's known as a flat line. Uh, so a lot of times you'll hear in different movies or TV shows they'll say he's flatlining or we have flatline and what they really mean to say is the patient's in a systole. It is the worst arrhythmia to be in. Um, eventually we will all be in this rhythm uh, and it is very terminal. Now we do treat patients that are in a systole and there have been uh, returns of spontaneous circulation in patients that are in asystole, but it is uh, the toughest rhythm to save someone from because you don't really know how long they've been in it and uh, it's uh, much less viable of a patient that's in uh, V-fib or even PEA. So the rate, again, it's going to be zero because nothing's happening. There's no rhythm, there's no P-wave, no QRS. Now there is such a thing as a ventricular asystole where your atria is still firing but your ventricles aren't doing anything and that would just show up as P waves. Sometimes it's called ventricular standstill and it would just show up as P waves without any QRS complexes. Kind of makes sense, right? But your typical asystole is going to have no electrical activity whatsoever. You also have something that a lot of people will refer to as an agonal rhythm where you have a patient that appears almost asystolic and then every once in a while they'll have a big, wide, ugly beat and uh, they really won't have a pulse to go along with that. That's just some pulseless electrical activity. And that is not asystole, but eventually they if they don't get uh, resuscitated, they will be in asystole. We haven't really talked about PEA. PEA is a type of pulseless electrical activity. It's not really a rhythm. Any rhythm can be considered PEA, technically. Uh, it's when a patient has a cardiac rhythm, but they don't have a pulse associated with it. That patient would be in what's called PEA, or pulseless electrical activity. So that's asystole. Now let's talk about some different types of artifacts, because uh, we've mentioned it in a few uh, ECG uh, cases and lectures prior to this, but it's important that we talk about artifact alone. Now, if you look at this rhythm strip here on the bottom, you'll notice that it, the baseline looks to be a little thicker. And if you look real close, it's because of artifact. So we call that 60 cycle artifact. And 60 cycle artifact is usually related from an outside source. So if you have your monitor plugged into the wall or you know sometimes uh, there's other electrical interferences, that can cause this type of 60 cycle interference or 60 cycle artifact. And generally, if you have big QRS complexes and big P waves uh, and, and you're monitoring a pretty good lead, it won't interfere with your rhythm interpretation, but it's generally not a good thing to have. You should try to eliminate it and uh, get a nice clean rhythm tracing. You also can have artifact from a loose electrode. We've probably all seen this at some point or another. If you haven't, you probably will eventually. You know, you got your diaphoretic patients that it's hard to get the electrical electrode to uh, stick to their skin, um, or they might have a lot of hair. If that electrode isn't sticking very well, you might get a whole lot of artifact, and that's it look, might look something like this. Um, and the idea is to identify which electrode it is, and you can do that by remembering Einthoven's triangle and remembering which leads uh, come from which electrodes. And then replace that electrode, dry the skin, use a benzoin tincture, shave the uh, patient, whatever you have to do to make those electrodes stick a little better. And then you also have, of course, movement. This is probably the most frequent type of artifact and you're gonna get what look, might look like a wandering baseline, uh, but this makes it very difficult to accurately interpret an EKG rhythm. So it's important to try to get, keep your patient from moving too much. If they're shivering, provide them with a blanket, um, try to keep the wires underneath their arms, and try to keep the EKG electrodes off of areas of a lot of movement. Now, traditionally, we put the limb leads, uh, we would put the electrodes for those limb leads out on the wrists and ankles, but we've realized that that is not great because patients move their wrists and ankles a lot. So we've moved those up to the torso, um, 
But if you've got a patient that's got dyspnea and they're, they're tachypnic or breathing really hard, that might move the electrodes a lot too. So you might want to move those top ones out to the deltoid muscles and move those bottom electrodes down to the uh, upper thigh area. So the best idea for movement is try to keep your patient still, uh, provide them with a blanket if they're shivering, something like that, and uh, see what you can do to uh, eliminate that type of artifact. So again, we're going to go through some rhythm strips. Uh, this one's obviously asystole. It doesn't get much easier than that. It's just a nice flat line. Okay, here we have an example of a different type of artifact again. Um, and looking at this, once the uh, video catches up, looking at this, uh, you can see it doesn't look like movement. It doesn't look like a loose electrode. And that baseline looks very thick, and that's from 60-cycle artifact. 60 cycle artifacts. So you're going to check your electrical outlet, uh, make sure you're not having any type of interference. Here we have another example of 60 cycle artifact. That big thick baseline comes from that 60 cycle interference. And you don't see this as often. You don't see that 60 cycle interference as often as we used to. Okay, here this is obviously a, a loose electrode. It's completely distorted the rhythm. You cannot identify the arrhythmia with this loose electrode, so you're going to have to fix that. And here we go with some movement. This patient looks to be shivering. Okay, so you've completely lost your baseline. It's very hard to identify your P waves, um, which makes it difficult to identify if there's some sort of arrhythmia going on. So you're going to want to try to provide the patient with a blanket, keep them warm, and eliminate that shivering. Here's another example of a shivering patient. Um, these EKGs are very common because a lot of times uh, people overlook the fact that their patient's shivering and that that's causing a lot of artifact. Here we have some 60 cycle artifact. Now this rhythm looks like it's probably torsades and I, it probably is even though we have the artifact. All it's doing is making the line uh, thicker. Um, so it's definitely a, a type of polymorphic ventricular tachycardia, probably torsades and you have that thick line from 60 cycle interference. And finally, here's another patient with some movement artifact. This is a shivering patient. And again, you're going to want to try to keep them warm. You can certainly identify the rhythm uh, below this. You know, you can see there's P waves here, and it looks to be a bradycardic rhythm. So you have a what looks like a sinus brady. But how do you know that there's not some P waves over here, and this is maybe a 2 to 1 AV block or something like that? So you're going to want to eliminate that artifact if possible. And that's pretty much it for this chapter. I mean, it was very easy, you know, just going over, wrapping up some things I haven't talked about yet. Now, if you're ready to go on to the next chapter, I highly recommend first you go back and review, you know, all the main arrhythmias we've talked about, um, and then maybe go on to the next chapter. I'm going to talk about some of the advanced concepts uh, with basic arrhythmia interpretation, some things that I haven't mentioned yet, um, and it might bring, shed some light on a couple other things, but it's going to be a good foundation before you go into 12 lead EKG interpretation. So definitely watch the next video prior to going into the 12 lead lessons. And uh, if you want to go back and review, go ahead and do that too. As always, don't forget to subscribe to the channel because I am adding videos on a regular basis. And until then, I will see you next time.